Hello and welcome to Speech Day, the 23rd of May 2020. This is the first Speech Day in Stowe's 97 year history, which has been cancelled. Even in the dark days of the Second World War, Speech Day continued. But instead of reflecting on all of the achievements of Stoics, as we would normally do, achievements in academics, in sport, in drama and in music, I want to pause to reflect on the achievements of some of our forebears, the Temple Grenville family, who gave us the majesty and the beauty of Stowe, and particularly the work of the head gardener, Capability Brown. But before we start looking at the gardens, I want to say that bricks and mortar, wonderful buildings and landscape gardens really mean nothing without the people inside the buildings and the grounds. It's a little bit dead and it's a bit lonely, but here's something to cheer me up and I hope it cheers you up as well. Have a lovely speech day. Stowe is what art historians often call a palimpsest. It's layer upon layer of art history, one on top of the other. If you look carefully enough, uh, you can get down to the very origins of garden history. It's one of the only truly original art forms that come out of England, and Stowe pretty much invented the landscape garden. Uh, the greatest art is not just an aesthetic experience, it's not just about appreciating beauty. There's often a moral tale to be told. So follow me and I'll tell you about the story of Stowe. Now, behind me, you can see the largest and possibly the most finely realized neoclassical building in, in the world. It's 300 yards across, the largest privately owned house in, in Britain, Wentworth Woodhouse competes, but we win that particular competition. And as I said, with the history of Stowe, you're looking at the evolution of a building. The first building appears around 1683. It's quite a small red brick manor, not particularly distinguished, built and designed by William Clear, who was an apprentice of Christopher Wren. So a typical William and Mary house. But over the next 100 years, Stowe really comes into its own. And what you can see behind me is a hybrid of the work of the great Scottish Enlightenment figure, Robert Adam, whose designs for Stowe were quite tricky, quite complicated, and they were finessed by someone called Thomas Pitt, Lord Camelford. And he was a, an, an, an aristocratic architect who worked on Robert Adam's classical designs, which had three, four different classical orders, and he simplifies it. So what we have today is this extraordinary building, which has got 24 Corinthian columns and 48 Ionic columns, and is this wonderful symphony of architecture and sculpture in the most beautiful landscape setting in England. Now you have to see the mansion as the mother of all temples. And as the house expanded, the garden evolved as well. Where I'm standing, which is actually on the cricket square, so probably wouldn't be allowed if it wasn't for the lockdown, um, this was an avenue of poplar trees. The original landscape garden designed by Charles Bridgman was incredibly formal. It was laid out in, 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 a, in the French style. So there were parterre lawns, there were straight lines, it was very geometric. But all that was swept away in the 1750s. Earl Temple, developing Capability Brown's vision for Stowe, decided to get rid of these, um, the French style of gardening and introduce something that was quintessentially British. Parterre lawns, poplar trees, 
avenues, even the fountain in the Octagon Lake behind me. All of these things were removed and instead we have this new planting regime. So it's rather like a theatre with stage flats staging and framing this entire space. And we have this grand sweep behind me, the Octagon Lake, which has been softened and naturalised, really doesn't look like an octagon anymore. And you sweep over the ha ha to the, the, the Corinthian arch behind me, built in 1765, again to the design of Thomas Pitt, Lord Camelford. And in one fell swoop, British landscape gardening was invented, invented here at Stowe. Nothing at Stowe is here by accident. Everything is here by design. And here I am standing in front of the, the Doric Arch. The Doric Arch was commissioned in 1768 to celebrate the visit of Princess Amelia, George III's aunt, who came to Stowe in 1770. And it does three things. First, it's this wonderful frame which takes us on a journey. In the mid-distance, you can see the Palladian Bridge, not the work of uh, Palladio, the Italian Renaissance architect, but a work, the work of a, an English architect called James Gibbs. Two miles away from where I'm standing, you can just make out the shape of Stowe Castle. And that was created in the 1730s to be the end point in that bluey-green haze to show you that anything that the French painters, Claude Lorraine, Nicolas Poussin, were doing on a two-dimensional canvas, we could do in one-to-one, -one real three-dimensional space. Go through the arch and it takes you on another journey. It takes you to Elysium, the place where the Roman gods chose to take the heroes, those who had really excelled, and to put them into paradise. And this is a glimpse of what paradise could be like. So let's go through the arch and experience paradise. Now, one of the most interesting things about Stowe is that it's never static. It's evolving, it changes. And these statues here are Apollo and the Nine Muses. And after 1756, when they cleared the south front of all those parterre hedges and the lawns and the statues, the statues were rearranged. And these statues came in 1756, and it's incredibly exciting to welcome them back, welcome back to Stowe, and we really look forward to hearing the music, the music of the muses. We're now at the Temple of Ancient Virtue, Prisai Vertuti. And this building is modelled on another building. You can see it in a place called Tivoli, just outside Rome, the Temple of Vesta. There's another version of it in the middle of Rome in the Forum. And of course, it's where the Vestal Virgins were the guardians of the temple. Our version at Stowe has been Stoicised. It's not Corinthian. It's got these really quite dainty Ionic scrolls, but you can see its importance. It's on a really raised platform. I'm surrounded by laurel bushes. We know that this is one of the key buildings of Stowe, and it's one of the masterpieces of the architect William Kent, who was employed at Stowe in the 1730s. Let's go inside and see what he tells us. Welcome to the inside of the Temple of Ancient Virtue. This is one of the most important buildings at Stowe because it takes us back to 5th century BC Athens, the cradle of our civilization. And there are four people here who are really important to help us understand what the Enlightenment was all about, because it was about going backwards into ancient Greece, then Rome, and moving forwards to the 18th century and the world beyond. First, the greatest philosopher of the ancient world, Socrates, with his cup of hemlock. Next, we have Lysurgis, a lawgiver, carrying a scroll of law. The next person up is Epimenondas, characterised by his sword, a warrior who gave liberty to Thebes. And the final figure 
is the most important poet in the history of Western civilization. None other than Homer. Poetarum primus, idem et maximus. A poet above all poets, a person of supreme creativity. And this is the key that helps us unlock the Enlightenment. Now, at this point in our journey, we have a choice. We can either go to the Temple of Modern Virtue, which was built by William Kent deliberately as a ruin. Why would he do that? Well, the idea was that in 18th century politics, particularly when Sir Robert Walpole was prime minister, there was no modern virtue. It was already a ruin. This was the man who had led Britain into the South Sea bubble, who sold political offices for money and built himself a great stately home in Norfolk. By contrast, Viscount Cobham and his patriot cubs, they were supposed to represent morality and everything that was good in the 18th century. So we have this contrast of good and evil. Behind me is paradise. It's the Elysian fields. It's the 18th century version of what heaven might look like. Elysium in the ancient world was into paradise. And this is not a bad evocation of what paradise could look like. Look at the trees, the clouds, you can hear the bird song, the water behind me. And then to just give you that connection from the ancient world to the modern world, we have the most important temple of all, the temple of British worthies. All the ideas that we celebrate today begin with the Temple of British Worthies, the most important temple at Stowe. So welcome to the Temple of British Worthies, where our journey finishes. Here, the ideas from the classical world, from the Temple of Ancient Virtue, are cascading down to be captured in this horseshoe-shaped exedra, a garden building that was built for Stowe to embody the pantheon of British greats, those who were thought in the 18th century to really, really matter. Going back to Alfred the Great through a journey into the Middle Ages, Edward the Black Prince, into the 16th century with Elizabeth I and Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake. And then onto the other side, we've got the thinkers, the scientists, the dramatists, the architects, Inigo Jones, John Milton, William Shakespeare, John Locke, and probably my favourite inscription in this temple, Isaac Newton, whom the God of nature made to comprehend his work. In other words, the 18th century, the age of reason, sees the beginning of the modern world. Thank you for listening.